Hello and welcome everybody. Before we begin, first of all, I want to thank you in advance for your kindness and your attention today. A few other things we have to do in preparation. Number one, my friends, cell phones. Do you have them? Okay, find your cell phone. Turn the ringer off. We don't want to make it sounds. Next, it, it does not belong on your lap. Okay, it belongs in a bag, if you've got a bag, or under the chair, under your leg, somewhere, okay? Those things are so distracting. Next, your mask. Let's see if it's working properly. Is your mask over your nose? Over your nose. Yeah, very good, okay? Grazie. All right, so with that done, I would like to welcome Adi Solomon, who will be introducing Dr. Butter to us. So, uh, hello, I am Adi Salman. Thank you all for being here. Before formally introducing our incredible speaker, I would like to share an excerpt, an excerpt from her website that says, refusing to be an enemy is simple. Oh, mask off, okay. Refusing to be an enemy is simple, profound, and anybody can do it. It is looking the other person in the face. It is listening. It is the conscious decision to open your eyes, your, eye, your ears, and your heart. It is the serious intention to see the other person as human and not a stereotype. But it comes with the responsibility we owe to every person to stand on the side of tolerance. The world cannot afford us to be bystanders in the face of oppression and hate. More than 80 years have passed since the Holocaust took place, and many people regard it as a history that is too far removed to have relevance to their own lives. But the truth is that there are so many important lessons to be learned from the Holocaust. Our incredible speaker, Dr. Irene Butter, was born in Berlin and grew up as a Jewish child in Nazi-occupied Europe. She survived two concentration camps and came to the U.S. in 1945. She has, she, has, she has shared her story numerous times in the United States, Israel, and Germany to help youth to understand the gravity of genocide and to motivate them to stand up against hatred, prejudice, and racism. In addition, she is the co-creator of the University of Michigan Wallenberg Medal and Lecture, which provides humanitarian role models for students in the community. She is also the co-founder of an Arab-Jewish Women's Dialogue Group. We are so thankful to have her speaking to us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Irene Butter. Thank you. Am I unmute you? I unmute you. Thank you very much for this generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here today, especially since today and tomorrow are Holocaust Memorial Days, Yom HaShoah, as we call it. And um, thank you to be here for that occasion as well. Um, I'm going to tell you the story of, basically the story of my childhood, first 15 years of my life and a little bit beyond that. <clears throat> and if I can see the first slide, please. <clears throat> I would like you to look at this map because it shows all the stops in my journey during the first 15 years of my life. It was not a voluntary journey. We did not decide to move from one place to another. It was all by force until I came to the United States when I began to be able to make my own decisions of where to live and where to move to. So I was born in Berlin, Germany, and I had an idyllic childhood when Hitler came to power and conditions changed dramatically for the Jews, not only in Berlin, but on the entire continent of Europe. My 
my grandfather owned a bank, and after Hitler came to power, the bank was taken away because Jews were no longer allowed to own a bank, like many other things they were not allowed to do. My father was his partner, and he became unemployed and decided to move the family to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He moved there, and he found a job with the American Express Company in Amsterdam. First two years were peaceful, but then the Nazis followed and occupied the Netherlands, and the persecution of Jews escalated. We lived there for another couple of years when we were deported first to Camp Westerbork, a German concentration camp within the Netherlands, and then to Camp Bergen-Belsen in Germany. After barely surviving one year, our family was included in an exchange transport and liberated from Bergen-Belsen. Um, our train took us to Biberach, Germany, a town in southern Germany, and after that to Switzerland, the south, the south of France, um, where in Switzerland my family was hospitalized, and um, I was then 14 years old, not allowed to stay with them, but sent further to a refugee camp in Algeria, North Africa. So that is the journey from Algeria then I finally came to America. So, so that gives you a framework for the story. Next slide, please. I want to show you some photos of my family. This is my parents' wedding picture. And the next slide. This is my brother who was two years older than I, Werner. And I, I was about one, he was three years old. Next slide. A picture of my father. I'm about five in that picture, five years old. My father was my hero, my idol. I adored him. Next slide. Here you see my grandparents. I had the fortune of living in the same house as my grandparents during my childhood. And they spoiled us and played with us and were very generous grandparents. I spent a lot of time with them. You see my grandfather holding my brother as an infant and my grandmother holding me as a baby. Next slide. So I told you that the Nazis took away the bank my grandfather owned, and we moved to Amsterdam. And this is the house where we lived when we got there. And on the right side, you see the family home of Anna Frank. Some of you may have read her diary, and her family also came from Germany, immigrated to Holland. We lived in the same neighborhood. I didn't know her well. We went to different schools, but um, I met her uh, once later on in when we were both in Bergen-Belsen. Next slide. So this is a school picture, typical picture taken in Dutch schools. I think it's about third grade, sitting at a school bench, a notebook, pen in the hand, and Anna, who went to a different school, had the same kind of picture taken of when she was in third grade. Next slide. Well, here is the first the symbolic sign of the restrictions that were imposed on Jews after the Nazis occupied Holland. And so this sign says, for Jews forbidden, and it's a sign on the tree of the biggest, very popular park in Amsterdam. We were not no longer allowed to enter. And 
This is just one of many other. We were not allowed to go to movie houses, theaters, museums, swimming pools, and many other places. We were not allowed to use public transportation, so no buses or trains. And after a while, they took away our bicycles. All Jews had to give up their bicycles to the Nazis. And if you don't have access to public transportation and they take away your bicycle, then your world becomes very small because you can only get to where you can walk to. Then other um, difficulties for Jews at that time was we had a curfew. We had to be home at eight o'clock every evening. We were not allowed to, to visit any friends who were not Jewish. We weren't allowed in their homes and non-Jewish friends were not allowed in our homes either. My best friend at that time happened not to be Jewish, so we could no longer play together in our homes, but could see each other only outdoors where we could be together. Uh, then there were other restrictions. Uh, Jews could not go to the soup food stores until after three o'clock in the afternoon. And this was wartime. There were many scarcities. Often there was no food available by three o'clock in the afternoon. So that was an, also a deprivation. And there were others as well. Now, worse than all of these, was the deportation. And Jews started to be deported and you didn't find your friends, your neighbors, your relatives who were Jewish. Um, it, was, it began to be a very sad time because you knew eventually this would happen to us as well. Next slide, please. Now this is a picture of a razzia. A razzia was a method used by the Nazis to deport the Jews. Sometimes they would arrest Jews on the street or at the workplace or in the schools, but many times they would go to neighborhoods and they would block off the entire neighborhood. They would tell everyone to get off the streets and then they would go from house to house and from door to door and whenever they found Jews, they would give you 10 minutes to pack your belongings, and then you had to leave your home. You could only take with you what you could carry. So that limited your belongings as well. And so here you see a picture. You see older people, younger people, people with children, babies and baby carriages, bundles, and suitcases and all kinds of stuff as the Jews are being marched away from their homes to a big square. And once we got to the big square, we had to wait for hours and hours because they evicted Jews from the entire neighborhood, hundreds of them. And once everyone had been rounded up, then they brought trucks and they loaded up on trucks and drove us to the railroad station. And here you see the next slide. <clears throat> this is what was waiting at the railway station. They were not trains for persons, but they were cattle car trains. And they loaded us into these wagons, sometimes 60 or 70 people squeezed together somewhat like sardines in a can. And once everyone was loaded into these trains, they would lock the doors, close them and lock them. And we had no water, uh, there was no food, and there was no air because there were no windows in these cattle, cattle cars. And then you would begin the journey so our journey was to Vesterborg, and we were left in the train for five to six hours before we came to Vesterborg. But many, many Jews 
were taken to death camps in Eastern Europe and the journey might take several days. So for several days, they would be locked up without food or water and it would be a dreadful journey and some people wouldn't even make it um, to, to arrive in the concentration camps. But this is what we experienced. And when we came to Westerbork, the next slide, please. This is what it looked like. You had the barracks in the left picture. They were pretty close together, lined up. And on the right side, you see the interior of the barracks and most of the space was taken up by steel flame, steel framed, three tiered bunk beds. The only thing on the bunk bed would be a straw mattress and then three people on top of each other meant that one third of the space under the bunk bed was yours to keep your belongings and that was all you had. Now the barracks were divided into two parts, one for men and one for women, women and children. Um, you were able to spend, uh, be together with the men, with families were together all times except at night. Uh, we slept in, diff in separate places. Now life in Westerbork was not pleasant, but not as bad as what was to come later. The adults all had jobs. Uh, jobs had to do with the upkeep of the camp or there were some mechanical jobs and women worked in the kitchen and, and with vegetables. Um, the, the, the work they did was not really such hard work, but anyway, most of the day they were at work. And children like me, didn't have anything to do. There was no school, there was no library, no playground, no books, no toys. Life was pretty boring there. My brother, who was two years older than I, he got a job as a messenger boy and they gave him a bicycle so he could bike all over the camp. But again, for kids like me and younger, there wasn't anything to do. Now, worse than this was the deportation from Westerbork. <clears throat> the camp was divided in two parts by a railroad track. So the railroad track went smack to, through the center of the camp. And every Saturday, a train pulled in, a cattle car train, like I showed you in the slide before, it pulled in, and no matter where you went in the camp, you couldn't help seeing this monstrous train sitting there the rest of Saturday, all of Sunday and all of Monday. You couldn't help seeing it. And the image was terrifying because Monday night around 11 o'clock, the barrack leaders would turn on the lights and they would read the names off a list of all the people who had to board, to board the trains the next morning. And most of the trains from Westerbork that transported Jews were cattle car trains that took them to death camps in Eastern Europe. The majority of people were, went to Auschwitz, but there were also some other death camps that they were taken to. And the journey might take three, four, even five days. They were cramped together in one of those cattle cars. So after the barrack leader had read the names off the list, we would always go, my family and I would go to other barracks to look up relatives or friends or neighbors or other people dear to us and check on them to see whether they had been on the list. And always there was someone who had to go that morning and we would spend the rest of the night with them and then walk them to the train early in the morning, 
saying goodbye and knowing that it was pretty certain that we would never see each other again. Then the train left and we would know that next Saturday, like clockwork, the same or a similar train would pull up for the same episode. And so even once you, you knew you weren't going on this train, you started worrying about next Saturday when you might be the one who would be on that train. Well, um, so it was anxiety for most of the week and all the time. Now, after we had spent about four months in Vesterborg, we received a package. And when, my fa when we were still in, in Amsterdam before the deportation, one day my father met a friend and this friend had just received four passports to Ecuador from Sweden, from a consul in Sweden. And this friend gave my father the contact information and he told him he should send a letter to the consul immediately, including four passport pictures. And he wouldn't have to say very much because the consul would know immediately why my father was writing to him. And my father did that the next day, but the passports never arrived. So the next slide shows the passports, I think. Here you can see what they looked like, and this was my passport picture. And um, I guess we kind of forgot about it. When a package arrived in Vest when we were in Vesterborg, and my father opened the package and found four passports for each, one for each of my family. And this made a huge difference. It was like a miracle because once we had the passports, we were no longer just Jews to be exterminated in a death camp, but we became exchange Jews and exchange Jews under a foreign policy formulated by the Germans meant that we qualified for an exchange process between German citizens living in the Americas and exchange Jews in Germany. So they kept us alive because they could use us as in an exchange process that brought German citizens back to Germany and helped them to win the war, they hoped. So when these passports came then, we were told that we weren't going to be there much longer in Vesterbork. We would be sent to Bergen-Belsen and we, the Camp Bergen-Belsen, life would be better than in Vesterbork, we were told and we wouldn't be there very long because we would be used for exchange. Well, another four months went by and then we, we um, boarded a train uh, to Bergen-Belsen. And here you see the picture. The barracks were pretty similar to those in Vesterborg. But the people we saw in this picture behind barbed wire, they did not look promising. They were very skinny, emaciated. They were wearing rags and they were skinny and they had sad, anxious expressions on their faces. So it didn't make, it didn't make us feel like this would be a better camp. And that was true. Bergen-Belsen was indeed a horrible camp. Um, horrible in the sense that adults had to work very hard. They had to do slave labor six and a half days a week from early morning into the evening. Hard labor, um, physically hard for the men uh, in construction, uh, doing digging dishes, digging ditches and uh, other hard work. And then the women worked in factory-like structures uh, where they did um, work with 
clothing, pulling apart clothing, and separating the good part from the worn out part so that new clothes could be sewed mostly for the army. Um, so that was one thing, hard labor, six and a half days a week. Limited food rations. The only food we got in Bergen-Belsen was one piece of bread about three inches wide, had to last a whole day. And then at night there was a soup. Most of the time it was turnips cooked in water. And if you were lucky, you might find a little piece of potato in your soup. Not enough to survive. This was not a diet, um, a nourishment that could keep people alive. And indeed, many, many people in, died in Bergen-Belsen. Um, so you wonder, why did the Nazis do that if they wanted to use us for exchange? And yet, they treated us in such a way that people could not survive. Contradictory, but that's how it was. In addition, conditions, the hygiene in the camp was atrocious. We lived in very congested conditions. There was only, in the bathroom, there was only cold water. There was no soap. The toilets were in terrible conditions. We had to stand on, we had to um, undergo appell, which meant roll call every day. Roll call took place, you can show the next slide, um, on a big square, you see it on the left side, we had to stand, it's not visible, but you had to stand in rows of five people, stand for hours, sometimes five or six or seven hours, rain or shine. You couldn't sit down. You couldn't talk to another person. You couldn't jump or do anything. Just stand in place for hours and hours to be counted. And many times they couldn't come up with the right number or they just wanted to keep us standing there. Sometimes roll call even took place more than once a day uh, because the Nazis had some reason to punish us. Well, I will never forget the time when we were standing on roll call and an elderly woman sat down on the ground because she couldn't stand up anymore and a guard came, a Nazi guard came, and beat and beat and beat at her until she was dead. And that was to be an example for other people to never sit down. It was not allowed. Now, my brother, he had, he outgrew his shoes. And so he had to cut out the front of his shoes where his toes were exposed because otherwise he couldn't get into his shoes anymore. And standing on the appell ground for days and days, for hours and hours in the winter, he got his, his toes got frostbitten and that created um, further problems, health problems for him. Um, so we had poor nutrition poor hygiene, congestion, and lice. Lice, body lice, everybody had body lice. You couldn't escape it. And lice transmit diseases. So the diseases that sprung up there were transmitted by the lice. And many, many people got sick. And many people died from these epidemic infectious diseases. Um, the one that killed most people was typhus. But there were others, other diseases like cholera, um, pneumonia, polio, dysentery, and, and other types of diseases. So most people were ill most of the time and couldn't recover. They were malnourished, they were weak, and still this terrible life had to continue. Now, um, at one point, 
when we were already in Bergen-Belsen, almost one year, and my father had gotten very ill. My mother was bedridden. She couldn't get up anymore, and I had to take care of her. Um, an announcement came through the barracks that anybody who had passports to, the, to America, South America, Central America, had to report to a Nazi doctor to be checked out and, and to be cleared for um, being included in the transport. And so first my brother and I went to, to see the Nazi doctor and he checked us and, and put a mark next to our name. He told us we would be leaving the camp the next day. And then we tried to get our mother to the Nazi doctor, but uh, when we got her out of bed, she collapsed. So we could not take her there. And then my father came home from labor and he looked terribly ill. Something must have happened to him during that day. And, and he was so tired, he said he couldn't go anywhere. But after some resting and, and my brother and I pleading with him, he agreed. And so leaning heavily on my shoulder, we walked to see the Nazi doctor to report there. And so the doctor asked him, are you John Hausenberg? He said, yes. Then he looked at me and he checked off my father's name and my mother's name. And, and that is another miracle because we never figured out how he could mistake me, a 14 year old child for a woman who was in her 40s. Now, it is true that both my mother and I, when we were weighed, weighed 76 pounds, very much emaciated, and we were wearing rags. And, um, but yet, um, I, don't, I don't know, I don't understand how my mother could have looked like me. Uh, nevertheless, that is what saved us. And the next day we got out of the camp uh, some friends of ours were generous and walked, carried my mother to the train. And so at some point we were all on that train, my brother, my mother, my father and I, and couldn't believe that here we were getting liberated from this hell of Bergen-Belsen. Well, two days later on the train, the most tragic thing happened in my life, even to this day, the most tragic was that my father died on the train in the night. He had done everything to save our family. And here we were so close to freedom, but he didn't make it. And so when we stopped in this small town, Eberach, his remains were taken off the train and, and put on a bench on the railroad station. And this was a Red Cross train. And we had no choice but to continue the journey. We were still in Germany and the war had not yet ended. Um, here you can see a picture, a student made a drawing that this was the good train, the Red Cross train. Well, two days later, we landed in Switzerland, and at the border, the Swiss border, the exchange took place uh, on the railroad track. On one side, there was a German train with German citizens who had been forced to come back to Germany to help win the war. On the other side were the people from Bergen-Belsen. And after the exchange took place, then um, we were, the train took us to Switzerland. And um, in, when the train stopped in a town called St. Gallen, my mother and my brother were taken, off, taken to a hospital immediately because they were so sick. And since I wasn't that sick, I wasn't allowed to stay with them. And as a 14-year-old child, I was sent 
with the other people from Bergen-Belsen to a refugee camp in North Africa. Next slide. Well, this is the only picture I have of the refugee camp. John Dark, um, that you can see the, what the barracks looked like. And one picture is just with a bunch of people there. And the picture on the right is with a number of teenagers like me who spent time together during the day because, again, um, there weren't any activities for us. There was no school. Um, we had freedom. We were allowed to leave the camp anytime we wanted to. We could take a bus to the nearby town and go to the movies or whatever we wanted to do. And the camp was situated on top of a hill. And when we walked down the hill, there was a beautiful deserted beach on the Mediterranean Sea. And actually we spent a lot of time on the beach and that's where I learned to swim. First time in my life that I had a chance to learn how to swim. So this was the camp in North Africa. We got new clothing. We had three meals a day. We had freedom. And, but I was alone. I was separated from my family. The war had not yet ended. So for three, approximately three months, I did not know whether my mother and my brother were still alive. But then one day I got a telegram that said they were recovering. And of course, that was great relief to me um, that someday we would see each other again. So we were hoping to be reunited after the war ended, but that did not happen. Um, I was never allowed to go back to Switzerland and they never came to North Africa. Now, it was our goal to, to come to America because we had family that had left Germany early in the 1930s uh, for America and we wanted to join them and they prepared the paper so we could get visas to America. But it took a long time to process the visas and to be able to travel to America after the war. So after being almost 12 months in Algiers, I was able to get a passage on a ship. And my mother and brother, they didn't come until a year and a half um, in Switzerland, a year and a half before they came to America. And this is the ship that brought me to America. It was a Liberty ship. Liberty ships were built in 48 hours, mostly to support the troops in Europe to fight the war. They weren't made for passengers, but nevertheless, we were happy to, to come no matter what comfort the ship provided. One day, an American doctor on this ship told us that some of the Liberty ships never make it. They break in half in the ocean during heavy storms. And so that's a picture of a Liberty ship that broke in half um, in the middle of the ocean. But luckily our ship made it. And after 21 days on a very stormy ocean, we arrived in Baltimore um, our, and stepped on the land of the United States. Now, um, since I came by my, well, I didn't come by myself, but I was the only one of my family. I lived with relatives. I lived with cousins of my mother and um, they were wonderful. They treated me as their own child and helped me in every way um, to adjust to America. The next slide. So the first thing I did when I came to America is start school. I had been deprived of schooling for three and a half years and um, entered high school. And this is my high school graduation picture. And after my mother arrived, um, I have to tell you that we were very poor. 
because everything had been taken away from us by the Nazis, all our belongings, we didn't have a home, and we didn't have anything. So we needed to work to make a living in America. My brother took a job during the day. I went to school during the day. He, he went to school at night and earned money during the day. I went to school during the day and earned money after school. And my mother, who had never worked in her life before, had to take menial jobs so we could live together and pay our bills. And one way I helped earn money was during summers, I worked as a waitress in resort hotels and um, um, made a lot of money and couldn't spend any because we worked seven days a week from morning to night. So that was my contribution. Well, in any event, poor as we were, there were many opportunities that America had to offer to immigrants like we were. And one of them was that New York City had tuition-free colleges. So even though we were poor, I was able to go to college. After graduating from high school, I went to graduate school, actually went to Duke University, which is not far from where you are now going to school. And there were jobs available. So um, there, there was no discrimination against us because we were immigrants and gradually we were able to build a new life. So after um, graduating from high school, I, I was at Duke University. Next, next picture. And this, at Duke University, I met my husband. We both were there for many years, earning our PhDs. Um, we got married sort of in the middle of our graduate studies. And the next picture shows you our family. I have, we have two children. Um, now they have their own children. The next picture, this is me reading books to my grandchildren and now they have their own children. So on the right side, on the left side, you see my two granddaughters. On the right is my grandson, and he's 15 now, but the two girls are parents now. And so here are two of my great-grandchildren, Adam, who is three, and Maya, who is a year and a half. And the third great-grandchild still needs to be included. In, in these pictures. The next slide, here you see me teaching economics at the University of Michigan. Next slide. Yeah, and this picture is included here because it is his, historic. Um, in my teaching at the University of Michigan, this is my department and it's graduation day and in the front row, you see all the graduates. They're all white and they're all men and they wear suits and white shirts and ties. And then behind them is the faculty and they are all white men. They have suits on and white shirts and ties because it's graduation day. And on the right, in the, on the right side, that's me. I'm a member of the faculty but I'm the only woman. And I want to point out that these days, one half, probably, at least approximately, five, half of the faculty would be women. And also, this is true of the students, probably half or more will be women at this time. And so there has been a lot of progress and while some things haven't changed, and you would also see a much more diverse student and faculty population now than was true in the 70s. So some things have gotten better, and we want to remember that. Next slide, please. 
So my brother has two children and I have two children. And one time at a family reunion, the four children asked us to take them on a trip to the sites of family history. And we were shocked when they asked that because my brother and I had never thought of going back to, to those dark years of our family. But then again, it was our children and we agreed. And so we went on this trip. We went to Berlin, we went to Amsterdam, we went to Westerbork, and here we're in Bergen-Belsen, one of the highlights of our trip. Next slide. And it's just a sign of Bergen-Belsen. Next one. Here you see a mass grave. When the Allies came to liberate Bergen-Belsen, the entire campground was littered with dead bodies, hundreds of them, and maybe thousands, and they didn't know what to do but to dig deep trenches and build these mass graves. And if you were to visit today, the memorial grounds would look like this. The next slide. And that is a, a stone dedicated to Anna Frank and her sister Margot. They both died in Bergen-Belsen. They were both buried in a mass grave, but after the war, people came and they could put up these gravestones. And so here you see that many people have been visiting it and leaving little mementos there. Next slide. And here we are, my brother and I and our children and one grandchild visiting my father's grave on a Jewish cemetery in Germany. I have been visiting there about half a dozen times. And I'm very grateful that my father, his body did not end up in one of those mass graves and that he is buried in a Jewish cemetery in, it is in, in Germany, but that we can go and see it. And that my children and their children have a place in Germany where they can where they can visit their ancestors if they choose to do that. So we made this trip and um, the next slide. After many years of teaching at the University of Michigan, I had the opportunity to help create an endowment dedicated to Raoul Wallenberg Perhaps you've never heard of him, but in my opinion, he's the greatest hero of the Holocaust. He saved almost single-handedly tens of thousands of Jews in Budapest from the death camps. He was a Swede. He was not a Jew. He's an alumnus of the University of Michigan where he went to school from 1951 to 1955. And um, his memorial allows it to choose a humanitarian from anywhere in the world who can be a role model for the students of the university and the entire community um, to demonstrate what human beings can do for humanity. And the next slide shows some of the people who they get a medal, who have become medalists. And here's the Dalai Lama, for example. And I had the privilege of meeting him when he came. Uh, there's also Elie Wiesel on the left side. And he was a very important spokesperson for Holocaust victims and survivors. And there, all the others are famous people um, who have deserved this medal and come to the campus and show how one person can make a difference, which is the motto of the Wallenberg Project. Next slide. And this is another project I have been involved in, um, co-founded a group called Zetuna, which means olive tree or olive branch, a symbol of peace. 
and it includes six Palestinian women and six Jewish women in Ann Arbor. This year, uh, 2022, we are 20 years old. We have been meeting every other Wednesday night in our homes for 20 years, listening to our stories and learning about conflict and what is happening in the Middle East and other part of the world and also uh, raising funds for, for some important projects like um, helping the orphans in Gaza and um, helping um, villages in the West Bank of Israel. And um, we're still doing it. Our theme is refusing to be an enemy. So, um, the three lessons I want to transmit to you are encompassed in, in this presentation. One of them is refusing to be enemies, which means let's get to know other people regardless of their nationality, of their race, of their ethnicity, of their gender, and whatever else is different from us because by doing so, when we listen to their stories and when we look into their eyes and when we get to know them, we discover that what we have in common is much larger than what differentiates us. And if we refuse to be enemies, our lives become so much richer. We can learn about other people, other customs, other cultures, and it's the benefit for all of us. Now, the other lesson is one person can make a difference. And that's the, um, the theme of the Wallenberg Project. We invite humanitarians from all over the world. Often what they have accomplished was done single-handedly. It takes courage, it takes sacrifice, often, but it can be done. And we, whether it's large or small, whatever we can do makes a difference. And even when we are confronted with large problems and we ourselves are small, whatever we do matters and whatever we do makes a difference and helps to build a better world. And the third lesson is never be a bystander. And that overlaps the other messages because sometimes we see things that are wrong, things that are unjust, things we don't believe in, but we turn our back. We think it's too much to get involved. And yet it's so important that we never are bystanders, that we don't turn our backs, that we take action when we see that something is wrong, that something is unjust, unfair, or something is evil. And so sometimes it's, it's hard to do that because maybe you're the only one. Consider bullying on the playground. You see one, one student bullies another one and you'd rather not get involved, but it's important you do. And you have options. You can either get help or you can confront the bullier or you can become an ally of the one that's being bullied. And if you're the first one to step up and object, interfere, intervene, then most of the time other people will follow you and it will make an it will have an impact on the situation. So that is the other lesson that is important. There is a documentary that um, a friend made about me visiting schools. It's called Never a Bystander, and it's available on YouTube if you're interested in watching it. And the rest of the time, 
should be left to the questions. I'm sorry, I thought we had more time. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Butter, for sharing your story with us today. Before we wrap up, we have a few questions we want to ask you. And the first one is, did your experience in the Holocaust change your view of humanity? Yes, it did. And it made me realize that we ourselves and all other people have it in us to be cruel and to do evil, but that all people are the same and that what's important is to recognize the humanity in each of us and to respect and protect each other rather than be divided and be hateful and um, practice all these differences that create injustice. Thank you. Um, we also want to know, you consider yourself a survivor, not a victim. Can you explain the importance of that distinction in your life? Well, I, of course, I consider myself a victim during and after the Holocaust, but it, um, after a while, and it took a long time, um, I realized that being thinking of myself as being a victim uh, makes me feel weak. It makes me feel um, mistreated and violated. And also it gives rise to revenge. You feel like if people mistreated me, then I have the right to mistreat others. And I didn't want to be that kind of person so I wanted to see myself as a survivor because that is a much more powerful way of identity where um, I have the power and the will and the opportunity to help others in need and to sympathize with them, to have compassion and to have empathy. And that's how I wanted to live. And before we wrap up, we would just like to give you a minute to leave any final message that you would like to with the students. Well, I think I have given most of my final messages, but I will add one. I think the Holocaust is an example of horror and of crime against humanity, very big crime, but people go through trauma suffer from trauma, from other conditions. And I know many of the students I've talked to, they have their own traumas, whether it be divorce of their parents, um, my mother's schizophrenic, um, my grandfather died before I could say goodbye to him. I'm homeless, I've had to move seven times this year and I had to give up my pet. My father is in jail. All of these traumas occur in families today. And um, I think that um, one final message is the goal should be to triumph over tragedy. Whatever you feel, don't give up hope. Remember that times can change and keep the faith. Triumph over tragedy. Thank you so much, Dr. Butter. Upper school students, thank you so much for being so respectful today. Um, I wanna give a huge shout out to Ms. Follett who really um, poured all of herself into this work. Um, Adi earlier, I think we had Adam with us. Um, but Samantha Dorfman came to me last year and said, Ms. D, we need 
Holocaust Remembrance Day, and we need it to be prominent. And so I really, really want to thank Samantha for um, being a leader, um, for being courageous, and for being persistent in all the work that she did for a beautiful, beautiful day for us today. So Samantha, round of applause. <laughs> Seniors first.